My next guest one of pro football's most was one of pro football's most ferocious linebackers, and, uh, and then he decided that football was not only too violent for uh, him, but uh, maybe corrupting himself and the country. Uh, Dave Megacy is his name. He's written a book which is not out yet. It's called Out of This League, but a lot of people are dreading its publication and uh, are not looking forward to it. And uh, I thought it'd be interesting to hear something about it ahead of time. Will you welcome, please, Dave Megacy? <laughs> I'd know you as a football player anywhere. Right, right, yeah. Well, why is it so many people are not looking forward to your book? Uh, I've heard so much about it, and uh, you, uh, how bad was football on you? Did it louse up your values, or is that well, putting it, it uh, to... I don't know if it loused them up. I think it kind of uh, bent my head around in uh, some strange ways, for sure. Tell me about that, though. You played in high school. You were a high school football star. Were you, in any sense, uh, um, corrupted by the sport in high school? Yeah, I think that, you know, I went to a small high school in a, in a cow town. Mm -hmm. uh, the cows used to come out and watch us, practice, watch us play the games Friday night. The actual cows. They actually did, right? Yeah. And uh, uh, I was a poor kid on a scratch. My, my father was a farmer. And uh, mm -hmm. I went to uh, a high school that was, I guess you might sociologically call upper middle class. And, and that was my entree into making it. In a, and I did by being a good football player. Yeah. Well, where did it begin to go sour for you, in what way? I think, Dick, it went sour for me really after, uh, or began to, uh, after my sophomore year in college at Syracuse mm -hmm. University. And uh, I had a great year up there my first year. And then uh, after that, it was kind of a downhill slide. And I uh, mm -hmm. played seven years in the pros with the Cardinals. And uh, that was about it. Well, what do you, what do you dislike about it? Um, You've said that uh, football glorifies fo for football glorifies violence. That may even be a quote from the book, or at least it's appeared in the in the, uh, in the talk copy, about right. the book. Anyway. Been, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think I think it mean? does. I think the whole raison d'etre of football is is violence. It's institutional violence. Uh, hmm. A man by the name of Thomas Morgan wrote a piece in Esquire about three years ago called "The American War Game." Uh, I read Blake, a former coach at Army, has talked about the values of football being the same values of that you find in life, the important values to, to stress. And some of these are obedience and respect for authority and uh, to be able to exhibit a certain kind of physical courage on the football field. And football players uh, are thought to be people who uh, exhibit this tremendous amount of courage. But it's a question about we all feel fear in it. You know, there, isn't, there, aren't, there are very few guys that I know who are really, truly uh, love to hit, you know, love to stick it in there. There, are there guys who are scared? Oh, hell yeah. Yeah. Sure. I remember sure Plimpton's scared. book, he talked about, I forget who the player was who, who was the guy who used to vomit before each game? Yeah, well, uh, we got a guy from Detroit, uh, Ernie Clark. Yeah. And uh, Ernie, the way Ernie used to beat it, would uh, he'd go in the locker room. And one of the interesting things we do is, uh, pros, we say the Lord's Prayer before the game. You know, it's like uh, everybody blesses the guns, you know. The other team's doing the same. And, and so... Uh, Ernie, Ernie would be in the, in the uh, and it'd be quiet, and Ernie would be in the, in the trainer's room and he'd hear this banging on the wall. And what Ernie would be doing, he'd be smashing his helmet into the, into the concrete wall to, uh, to kind of get himself ready for, the, ready for the contact. And one time he did it so hard he split his helmet. He came staggering out of the thing and it'd be cracked on his helmet. Um, well, is this bad for a guy? Is it bad for a guy? Yeah. <laughs> he must have hurt his head, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Doing it. <laughs> Well, but he wasn't holding the helmet in his hand. No, he, he had, had his, his head, head in it. Right. Yeah, he oh, was that puts a whole wall. different coloration yeah. on it. Right. Wow. You, you pray like, oh, Lord, make me big and bad today? Well, uh, no, you just say the Lord prayer, Lord's Prayer and say... Uh, what does that have to yeah. do with doing unto others as you had them doing to you? Hell, I don't know, Janice. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of the uh, inconsistencies Dichotomy in the whole thing, right? And one of the... Game. Right, right. And I think it's. Uh, more if we don't have those kind of games here, because if people have to get rid of. It's just like youngsters being handed play guns, a toy that's a gun. They grow up not knowing, having any fear for it or respect for this horrible, lethal. Um, incident. Yeah, I it's think I think terrible. that's true. I think you know football serves a, serves a function, I, and I see it as a kind of dichotomous function. And on one hand, it titillates people uh, by uh, glorifying violence in, in the sense that. Football is the 
only major sport in this country whose sole raison d'etre, in other words, his basis is violence. Mm. In other words, I can't, if you're a tight end and I'm playing opposite you, John Mackey, and I can't, you know, psych you out and fake you out and put moves on you, at <laughs> some point it comes to a showdown and I have to defeat you. I have to do violence to your person or you have to do violence to my person. But everybody expects okay. that as part right. of the game. And I think that, all right, this is the titillating function, but the pacifying function is, and I've experienced this out on the field, if, if like a guy really gets stuck really hard and uh, you hear the fans go, ooh, like that. You know, mm -hmm. it has this kind of effect of you know, letting it down. And by the time the fans are through with 60 minutes, I mean, they're, they're kind of wrung out. And I, I think it does serve that, that function uh, in this society. And uh, I see it as a negative thing, though, because... Oh, I, yes. because uh, but it's also the daddy sitting up in the, you know, watching the whole thing. Yeah. They're just right back there on the field and go... Yeah, there's a whole vicarious... Why, why is it a picture. negative thing, though? If, well, it, serves it, a, if well, it serves a valuable purpose. Well, you know this uh, thing Conrad, Conrad Lorenz talks about, about the yeah, ritual yeah. among animals, yeah. that, and that it's football, in a sense, is the acting out of that ritual that's been deprived of... of Defending no, your territory so. and That's defeating someone, and it's, it's a good, may, it, maybe it's a good. It's a good uh, no, let me just finish this because I think valve. that, yeah, the safety valve is, an, and I think that if you, it's kind of like you take people's minds off of you know what's really bugging them and the real problems that they have to face, and they, mm -hmm. you know in their own personal lives, and it's like uh, as I've said, middle America's theater, you know, it's Nixon's yeah. theater, and uh, you know it's laid out every Sunday for people, you know, it was it was interesting, and this. If you remember when uh, John Kennedy was assassinated, uh, the National Football League played their games. And the country was, at that time... Two days later. Right. The country in that time was in a period of mourning. Yeah. And Roselle, the <laughs> commissioner, made the decision that we should play football because we needed to pull the country back together. You know, it's the idea if everything is... is, is uh, if we can play football, then our country's not disintegrating, that kind of thing. You know, it's really weird, but uh, that... That's how I read it. Are, are, you, are you suggesting that he didn't believe that, but, or that he did believe it in the Well, I think wrong. that there are a lot of things operating on him. Certainly the owners who were going to lose their, uh, their stadiums full of people and the yeah. television people who had a lot to lose. When you were at Syracuse, now that's a good college, for, or obviously, for football because of all the guys that have come out of it. Yeah, outlaw well, school. <laughs> uh, what? It's an outlaw school. Uh, what does that mean? Okay. Well, there are certain schools that, that make, make uh, pretenses of, of uh, their ball players having academic credentials, and Syracuse isn't one of them. Uh, it's not. The function up there is, is you go there to play football, and it was really interesting because, you know, if you contrast like a Ben Schwartzwalder versus a Bud Wilkinson, Wilkinson is going to teach you all these values. He's going to say, look at you know, you've got to be a, a humble, contrite, polite, uh, clean cut the whole trip, you know, and stay out of bars and away from loose women. But uh, Schwartzwalder, you know, if you, if you produced, uh, you could do any damn thing you pleased. And Which of those guys is right? Well, uh, I think that uh, given the nature of football, I think Schwarzwalder is, and given the nature of what college football does to the individual players, one of the most interesting, one of the most exploited minorities in the country, you know, are college football players. You know, they get paid approximately 25 well, cents an hour. A few others. Yeah, yeah no, I'm, no, obviously true, Janice, but I'm just saying is that a guy earns, you say, uh, you know, the argument is, is that uh, we're giving these guys a college education. All right, out of my class at Syracuse, one guy graduated. Okay, you know. <laughs> out of your <laughs> that kind of trade among the football players. Yeah, other football players. Out of my class, one guy graduated. Do they know. really do all their class work? Well, do they? How can I, see I had a brother. Another, I had a brother once who, uh, who he was a hell of a football player. My brother Dennis, mm -hmm. and he needed uh, needed some some grades, so he signed up for these courses in summer school, and he went back to Cleveland and worked, and came back and. He had him in six units of A's. So I mean, that's the kind of. Wait a minute. What was what was wrong? Somebody about else took the class. Well, well no, they just filled him in on the records. You know. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. Right. Keep him eligible. Mm -hmm. You have to maintain your eligibility, which is a C average for approximately 15 hours at Syracuse. So you know, this is you know, in one sense, you know, the reason for the book is to really talk about uh, this reality. I think most most people who really dig football uh, uh, think it's uh, pure American uh, young. Americans out there doing their thing and, and reflects all these positive values of society. And on the contrary, I think it, I think it reflects more the values that, that we want to de-emphasize. And I say we of, you know, the counterculture as Rozak has defined, people, uh, people of the movement and so on. They say that, um, like, well, you hear sometimes anyway, that a guy who is uh, there in a football scholarship and is doing well can get away with just about anything he wants to and still stay in school. 
what are some of the <laughs> what are some of the any things he can get away with? How, how uh, true is it? We had one guy who uh, uh, threw a bowling ball out of an eight-story eight dormitory at the RA. The RA is a resident advisor. He's a guy that mm. you know corrals the, the people, <clears throat> and he was apprehended because he was pretty juiced. And uh, he said his only regret was that he didn't hit him. And just <laughs> He and the guy, and but he, you know, he he stayed there. He stuck. You know, I mean, there there are just various stories. I think you know you can get in kind of a war story thing of telling how bad a certain guy was, and mm -hmm. Syracuse had its had its group. Yeah. And, uh, don't don't a lot of guys think you're a traitor though to the traitor. cause, a Benedict Arnold to football. Oh, wow, uh, why don't you good, why don't you just question. keep quiet and let us make a lot of money and some? No, I really don't. If you Listen, don't like it, get out. And... No, I'll tell you. I'll tell you why because. After the season last year, uh, Jack Scott, who has just been written up in Locus, the guru of uh, the sports revolution, I think you saw that piece. Uh, Jack was teaching a, a course at, at Cal Berkeley, and he invited me out to be a guest lecturer, and I went out and, and, and did that trip. But while I was doing that, I got to, you know, to talk to the scholarship football players. It was interesting because this course was run by a professor who believes that grades are totally irrelevant, you know. And his his idea is, is that learning in a learning something is the most important aspect of it, not the product, which is the grade. Mm -hmm. And so consequently you could receive any grade that you wanted to. So there's a liaison man in the Cal Athletic Department that any free courses like this he'll shoot great numbers of ball players to. So we had a captive audience of about twenty guys, twenty yeah. football players. And I was able to rap to them and I found out that that just the opposite, that their gripes and the way that they've been psychologically kind of run over in high school and college, that they really feel what's happening. They really feel that they're being kind of outsiders now. They feel their exploitation, and they, they want a platform for articulation. And uh, I, I've, I was really anticipating, you know, they were going to waylay me in the parking lot or something. We're going to have a battle, but uh, just the opposite. People assume that uh, jocks are generally um right-wingers in some sense. I mean, yeah. I'm oversimplifying everything here, but uh, it's surprising. There have been a lot of things lately where I think 66 players uh, protested the, on, on Columbia alone on their team protested the Cambodian Yeah, well, invasion. last year it's we like, had uh, the Cardinals. Uh, I did a petition last season for the 15th, October 15th moratorium. We had 37 guys sign it uh, calling for immediate withdrawal of troops in Vietnam. And uh, so I don't think that that always holds true, but you can kind of assume that it's true, and I think that most people do assume that football players are right-wingers because they feel kind of intuitively of what kind of values that football is trying to teach people. And, mm -hmm. and football is that kind of a game for the participant and for the spectator. What would you do about yeah. it? What would I do about yeah, it to like change it? I really don't know. You don't I mean, want it eliminated from the scene, do you? Well, I don't know, Dick. I'm really you know, in a dilemma on that, and uh, mm -hmm. to be very frank about it. Uh, I, I certainly would de-emphasize it and attempt to return the game as such to the players, to let them have the decision making. You know, one of the, the things that I don't think the Players, players Association ever realized, but they could have, we could have had a football season this year without the owners. You know, we could have, the Players Association could have contracted with uh, probably some TV network, hired the stadiums yeah. and played football. And uh, I think they settled that just before we went on. Right, I, I haven't seen sure the paper the today, so I don't, I don't really know either. What makes a bad coach? What makes a bad coach? You know, I found it interesting that the worst, the worst coaches are the guys who've never done the trip. And uh, does that mean played the game? Never played the game, right? Okay. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> they, uh, they're just very heavy people, and uh, they're on a vicarious authoritarian trip, and they just want to see you perform, and they mm -hmm. just love to see you hit. And we do up in training camp a drill called we call the Oklahoma drill, where, like, my position as linebacker, I'd be getting across from a from a tight end. They have a back behind him. Uh -huh. And then two dummies, okay. And the purpose is to annihilate the guy over you. My purpose, and then tackle the guy. Mm -hmm. And his purpose is to block me out of the way, and so the ball carrier can run by me. And uh, coaches really get it on doing that, you know, watching it. They really get behind it. Hmm. Players don't necessarily do, but. You know. <laughs> I like the names for. I think Schwartzwalder, Schwartzwalder sounds like a, a coach. Schwartzwalder is a beautiful name, yeah, right. right. Lombardi sounds Lombardi. like one, but Weeb Eubank. How do you explain? <laughs> that? <laughs> Man, I mean, that just. No. Uh, well, would you ever become a player again under any circumstances? No, I don't, I've, I've had it as, yeah. you know, I've done seven years in the league and... Uh, you did very well. You yeah. were making good money. Making good money. So and, they can't uh, say you uh, was a, weren't. Also ran, right. But yeah. as Chip Oliver, and Chip, Chip is the uh, Oakland Raider outside linebacker who quit, and Chip's living in a commune over in Marin County. 
mm -hmm. in California. The mustard seed, and Janice may know about it. Yeah. Yeah. And he's really a far out guy, he's a very together person. And he, he told Al Davis, the GM, he said, listen, you, know, you treat me like a man and I'll play. I really want to play, I like to play football. But I can't put up with uh, you know, the bull crap you know, that you have to go through in training camp. Bull it, feathers. Bull feathers, right. <laughs> Imagine like, yeah, that's lying it. around Marin County, being nice to people and having people be nice to you is a lot better than kicking the hell out of you. I don't yeah, know. Like it's a, it's a uh, right, I, would admit, I mean, I just sounds like more fun to me. You know? Yeah, it is. Right? I, I don't know if I, I mean, like, maybe I question I mean, the idea like that you can't. That do. is better than that, right? Right. 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 <laughs> that is better than no, that. That is better than that. Hmm. You know, like... I'm learning a lot here tonight, I'm going to say. Then all sports uh, wouldn't have to go. No, I don't think so. I, I, Ice know, hockey is pretty rough. Yeah, it is pretty rough, but... I'm not talking about... There's that. something special about football, you're saying. Well, though. yeah, let me just run a wrap down. Can you do it in 30 seconds? Yeah, the, the speciality of football is that inherent in the structure of the game, there has to be a physical confrontation where one person has to defeat another in most right. positions. No other sport is like that. Hockey isn't like that either. You know, the resident debt for hockey is to get the what puck in the boxing net. Or yeah. that's boxing, right. And I'm talking about team sports mm -hmm. and major sports in this country, right? Mm -hmm. Did you have trouble finding a publisher? Well, I did, interestingly, I did. And because I contacted some of the major houses here in New York and they kind of turned me down and Ramparts Press uh, gave me, uh, I guess it's considered a small advance and I did the book. Simon & Schuster is doing the national distribution, so we're gonna get good coverage on it. And, uh, hmm. I'm very pleased with the way it's going. Are there any professional athletes who aren't writing a book this year? Yeah, I don't know. It's the year form. I guess Johnny Sample's doing it, too. We have a message. Uh, we'll be right back.